All right, we're going to go ahead and begin. Again, I'm Matt DeGoyer, the Regional Director for the Lupus Foundation in the Pacific Northwest. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Lupus and You educational program on understanding Sjogren syndrome and Raynaud's disease. Uh, with that, I'd like to share a little bit about our schedule for this evening. We'll be hearing from our uh, friend at GSK, Paula White, who will talk about shared decision-making with your medical professionals. We also have the true pleasure of being joined today by Dr. Arinola Dada, who will talk about understanding Sjogren's syndrome and Reynolds disease. And lastly, I'll share a little bit about some of the newest resources, as well as some of the uh, foundational resources that you have available to you through the Lupus Foundation of America. Before we get started, I would like to thank our sponsors who have made this evening's presentation possible. First and foremost, I'd like to thank GSK, Thank you, Paula, for your support of this evening's educational event. I'd also like to thank Pfizer, Pharma, and WeWork for help. So with that, I have a couple of housekeeping items. We encourage you to ask questions. We'll have time after each of our wonderful speakers to answer some of your burning questions this evening. You can simply click on the Q&A button on your uh, Zoom software and enter your question and we'll get to as many of them as we can. I believe there's also a way you can make your identity anonymous if you prefer not to have your name visible to us. Uh, and lastly, we are recording this evening's event. So if you would like to rewatch, we'll be sending out a link after the evening's event and also will be uh, um, giving you the link so you can share with friends who are unable to join us this evening. So with that, <clears throat> I would like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Paula White with GSK. Paula is a registered nurse and patient engagement liaison with GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals. She grew up in the Midwest where she attended college and earned her bachelor's degree of science in nursing from the University of St. Francis in Illinois. She has 25 years of experience within the acute care and community health settings. Early in her career, she discovered her passion to ensure patients are knowledgeable about their diagnosis and have the ability to develop self-confidence in managing their disease. She has spent 20 years educating patients and raising awareness regarding respiratory and immunology diseases. She has a strong regard for patient suffering with chronic illness and strives to make sure that each patient she touches walks away feeling empowered to continue to learn how to live their very best life. So with that, I'd like to welcome Paula White. Welcome, Paula. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you for having me this evening. I'll go ahead and share my screen and let's see here one second. There we go. I hope everyone is able to see my screen now in, in full screen mode. <clears throat> So again, thank you so much for the warm introduction, Matt, and I'm honored to be here to really, as Matt said, share my passion for patient education, and I hope to equip you all today with information regarding you at the, at the center of your care dealing with chronic lupus, and really um, just when you deal with chronic decision making or chronic illness, shared decision making is so important in your care, regardless of what your diagnosis is, navigating the day to day and putting together all the pieces from multiple healthcare providers in your care really needs to be something that, that you understand you're a part of. So thus the, the topic today that I'm sharing regarding shared decision making and um, again, as Matt said, I am a patient engagement liaison. I work for GlaxoSmithKline. And the presentation and information I share with you today 
by no means takes place of any conversation with your doctor and does not guide you as far as your treatment. But again, I hope to empower you to feel the, um, you have the authority to really work with your doctor and, and meet your treatment goals for managing your chronic illness. So we'll start by, you know, just talking about the basics of shared decision making. If, if you look at, at this picture here, it's busy. There's, there's people coming around a, a, a table or a center of the room, if you will. And not that we've been this close lately, but right, we, you know, it takes a decision and a team, if you will. And you can think of this as your healthcare team, as your, your support system, your family, friends, loved ones, but coming together and making decisions as, as a team really is what shared decision-making is and, and what we're gonna dive into over the next um, slides. So what is shared decision-making? First and foremost, it's collaborative. So this is a, a two-way conversation, right? Where you collaborate with your healthcare team, you feel that you are able to bring questions and, and get answers and have the um, ability to collaborate back and forth. So doctor's gonna have questions for you, right? And you are, you are able to really collaborate and partner in decision-making regarding your treatment, any tests, procedures, that sort of thing. It's cooperative in that you know, once a decision is made with you and your healthcare team, you, you wanna cooperate, right? And do your part as, as you are the center of choosing with your doctor, what those goals are, what your treatment options are and, and what that journey is going to look like. So being cooperative is providing feedback, right? Based on the treatment choices that you're making together in, in this collaborative engagement and, and following through on, on your end of the bargain and then expecting that of your healthcare provider as well. And finally, it's communicative. So, uh, you know, there needs to be conversation. You need to go prepared with questions. We'll talk about that when you meet with your doctor in the office. Um, take information from your loved ones. I know it's a little tough right now. Maybe you can't take someone into the office with you, but that communication constant back and forth, sharing, you know, the good, bad days, you know, everything that's going on with you when you're not with the doctor. You may only see your providers maybe once every three months, maybe every six months, some of them. So that communication has to be able to take place when you're in front of each other, as well as be able to take place, right, when maybe you're at home and maybe you have a new symptom and you need to feel confident and reaching out to your healthcare provider. Maybe, maybe not wait until that next visit if it is something that you need to be able to communicate in a, a sooner fashion than your next scheduled appointment. You are at the center of this um, decision-making process. You need to bring your preferences, your personal values, your goals that you have in, in your life, what you wanna achieve and, and what is better for you. What is your best life? living with your chronic illness, really what you want that to look like. Your healthcare provider, again, is a, such a key part, brings their clinical expertise, their experiences in the field of medicine that they're in, um, and, and shares this expertise with you as, as options, right? Um, the, the, their background, their they're what they've just seen on a day-to-day -day basis, the clinical research and that can be pulled in and shared with you so that you are able to make a collaborative, communicative decision regarding your care. And again, I mentioned loved ones and, and maybe right now they can't come with you, but guess what? Those loved ones are an important aspect of your care, their support providers, their perspective matters, their view as to how they feel that you are managing chronic illness is something then you can communicate back to your providers as well. So again, shared decision-making, it's an ongoing process. The, you know, chronic illness is exactly what it is. It's ongoing. Many chronic illnesses don't have a, a cure. And with that, there are going to be times where you're making 
different decisions. You're weighing different options in, as to treatment based on how you feel um, and how you are, um, you know, maybe your symptoms change over time. Every, every patient, no matter whether you're, um, you know, dealing with something like lupus or lupus and Sjogren's, I know Dr. Dada is gonna speak about here next, but when you're dealing with that, every patient is different. You have your own story, your own history, and that's what really needs to come to the table in this communication and conversation with your provider in order to help you be able to make your own best decisions for your health and your care. So why did why you know why does shared decision making matter, right? Um, treatment plans can be complex. The you know just the fact that you all are here today, you're learning about your your illness, your disease, your your passion to to grow and be able to take that information. Some of you on the line may be newer um, to your diagnosis, and some may have been warriors for quite some time, but those treatment plans change over time. That's, again, what chronic illness is. It's ongoing, and those treatment plans can be complex. The treatment options can be complex. Tests and numbers and values. So again, you're learning as much as you can so that you can have that, that two-way conversation in managing and, and making decisions for your care. There's no single right answer. As I said, you, you know, you've seen one person with a chronic illness and maybe you take that, that another person, you may know someone else that is suffering with your same chronic illness and your, your two stories are different, your pasts are different, your symptoms may be different at different times, more severe, maybe milder at times. So there's not one right treatment plan or one right treatment option um, that's cookie cutter for everyone. Your voice and your choice, I mentioned earlier, your values, your morals come into the decision-making process. And it is important that you express that as well. What will fit into your life? You know, some treatment or procedure, something may fit into someone's life, but maybe, you know, taking a medication four times a day is just not realistic. If you're like me and you work full time and you've got, you know, kids and a family to manage and, you know, you need to be able to have a voice and be able to speak up in making those treatment decisions. And again, what fits for you and in your life and, and let the doctor know if, you've made a choice and it's no longer fitting life, right? Or, or if maybe this treatment doesn't seem to be achieving the goals that, that you and your doctor thought would be what you were working toward or striving toward to achieve at the time that the decision was made. And finally, again, just be proactive. Patients who are engaged, as I said, so happy you're here today, but patients that are more engaged tend to get, research has shown, get more out of their care. They feel more involved in their treatment plan. Making healthcare decisions. So let's talk a little bit before we end here about putting this into action. So making these decisions, um, what is your role in shared decision-making? I showed you like at the center of it all, right? So it's important, again, be proactive be engaged. If you need to reach out prior to your next visit, again, do so. Learn as much as you can. The LFA has so many great resources on their, their website, lfa.org, that you can tap into. I'll share some information through GlaxoSmithKline's um, Us in Lupus. Some of you may have heard of that. You can go to get tools um, to be able to manage your disease, track symptoms, that sort of thing. There are tools and resources that are available to you that you can engage, um, you can take in with you to your doctor's office if you've got a journal or anything like that, that you're writing down and tracking your symptoms. Again, knowing your values, your goals, what do you want your chronic illness to look like in your life? and own your health story. As I mentioned, and you know, every patient that suffers from any chronic illness has their own history, their own story, where they are and where they wanna go. And that is so important for you to own that story, be able to tell your story to everyone that you need to share information with, 
And again, that can be something that's kept in something like a health journal. I think it's so important that you are jotting down anything on a daily basis, as far as your symptoms, how you're feeling, the, the severity maybe of those symptoms, good days, bad days, any comments or insight from family that you would like to add into your health journal, questions that you may have for when you are going to be in contact with that doctor. So you don't forget, right? Sometimes we end up with, with brain fog and you get in front of the, the, the doctor and you had a, a burning question and now your support person's not with you and you can't remember what it was, but it was so important. So write it down at the time and then make sure don't be like like me and some people may be don't forget that journal at home then right so take your story with you and know your story and what your desires are and prepare for every health appointment you have if you look in your calendar you know you have an appointment coming up with with Dr. Dada and you've got to write down oh these are the questions we needed to make sure that that are addressed at the visit that is coming up do that a night or two before so that you have that handy. Um, I personally have had to go as far as put that in the car the night before because I've done all that and I've driven away and gotten to the office and didn't have it with me. So whatever it is to help you remember your, your journal, your tablet, whatever it is that you're keeping notes about your, your, your interim between your visits, what's going on so that you make sure that you're prepared for those visits. Um, in, um, wrapping it all up here, when it's time to make health decisions, you have to think carefully about the decision, get the information you need, partner with your doctor to make decisions, um, talk about the risks and benefits, side effects that really know the expectations and the outcomes if you're changing treatments and that sort of thing. Feel confident about calling the doctor and letting them know, bouncing something off. Hey, is this something that I was supposed to expect? Based on this treatment, there should be someone available, a, a nurse or someone in the office that you could reach out to. Stay engaged again as you are today. Stay engaged in the decisions that you make till you see the doctor again. That's why taking notes and, and journaling will help because doc's going to ask you, how's it been going since your last visit? And you want to have some answers. You want to have some questions and you want those questions to be answered. And then finally, involve your support system in that, whether they can come with you or not. And just remember, shared decision making is an ongoing process for you to be the center of and involved in. And I want to thank you. That is the, the slides that I had to share. I mentioned that I would pull up a, a QR code, barcodes for some of you. If you happen to have your phones handy, you can also go to usinlupus.com if you would like and, and get resources and tools to help manage your disease. But if you have your phone handy and you open your camera, you can actually hover over this code and it will take you to a link. Just click on lead me and it will take you directly to the Us and Lupus website. Set your phone aside and you can open it up and have a look at it a little, little bit later on. And I thank you again, Matt, um, for having me. I thank the LFA for having me and being able to share this important information with you. And um, hopefully you've gotten a, a notepad and pencil and paper if there's anything that you wanted to jot down from my talk, but I hope you definitely have that handy for Dr. Dada's talk going ahead. Um, and thank you again. Terrific, thank you very much, Paula. Does anyone have any questions for Paula? Feel free to put those in the Q&A. I do see that there's one question, but I think it'll be a little more appropriate for Dr. Dada, so I'll share that, uh, that particular question later. But any additional questions for Paula surrounding shared decision-making? Just checking here to see if anything's popping up. I'll give it just a second longer here. Okay, I, I'm not seeing any additional questions. So Paula, it may be that they pop up as we're going through uh, Dr. Dada's presentation. Uh, one person says, thank you, Paula. That was very informative. So uh, thank, thank you again. And I'll stay on. I'm gonna to listen to Dr. Dada's talk as well. So if something does come up, I'll be able to keep a look in the chat as well. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you, Paula. So with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker,
Dr. Aranola Dada. Dr. Dada was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, where she received her undergraduate degree and MD degree at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. She returned to the United States and completed her internal medicine residency at the Mercy Hospital of Pittsburgh, now uh, the University of Pittsburgh, followed by a fellowship in rheumatology at the University of Washington, right here in Seattle. As a practicing rheumatologist since 2001, Dr. Dada wears many hats as a mother, teacher, mentor, and speaker. She's a fellow of the American College of Rheumatology and active in multiple professional organizations, including the American College of Rheumatology, Washington Rheumatology Alliance, and many others. She's board certified in internal medicine, rheumatology, and clinical densitometry. Did I do okay with that, Dr. Dada? <laughs> um, her clinic, Overlake Arthritis and Osteoporosis Center is also starting a specialized clinic in for gout patients to serve the greater Seattle community as well. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Aranola Dada. Welcome, Dr. Dada. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Kelsey and Samantha, uh, for putting this together. Quick question. I'm, I'm, I think I'm sharing my screen. I just want to make sure that's a fact. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Okay. Well, yeah. So, and then, um, and then that was really uh, a good talk, Paula. Um, I, uh, I really advocate for my patients to write things down so that we can really have an effective talk um, and so that we can kind of get to our mutual goals uh, with making sure that my patients get the best use of their time so that we can have the best outcomes. So as Matt said, I'm Arinola Dada. I'm a physician rheumatologist. I've been practicing in the greater Seattle area for about 18 years in our practice. And I love my patients. I love talking about autoimmune diseases. So somebody's gonna have to stop me <laughs> at some point <laughs> before we run out of time. So with that said, um, I'm looking forward to questions at the end, so please type away. Um, I try to make this as informative as possible. And so um, here we go. So uh, the talk is about Sjogren's and um, Raynaud's and then how it um, relates to lupus. And I think there's no talk, there's no way you can really talk about these things without really explaining what an autoimmune disease is. So I have my little cartoons here. But essentially, the summary of it is that uh, the body gets confused, right? So I have an analogy uh, that I use typically, which is that I like to imagine the body as a country and the immune system is the military. And um, the military is supposed to protect us from foreign invaders as well as domestic invaders. So the foreign invaders in the case of the body is bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And so the military should fight those foreign invaders. And then the domestic invaders um, are more cancerous cells. So again, the immune system's job is to fight those. And so when there's an autoimmune disease, I mean, something is wrong, okay? So my little cartoon here shows, you know, our cells looking at other cells that look like us and say, hey, you guys, uh, there's something wrong here. You're not part of us. And the cell is saying, what? Um, so that's really what the um, autoimmune disease is about. It's really anarchy, okay? Um, the body cells are fighting each other. They don't understand that they're on the same team. And, and so that's where kind of autoimmune diseases all arise from. So, um, and so the talk today is about Sjogren's and Reynolds. And these are two common conditions that happen in patients with lupus. So as we know, lupus is one of the you know, well-known autoimmune disease that typically the immune system attacks almost everything from the hair follicles to the, to the tippy toes, right? And there's really no organ spared in lupus. But where we're gonna talk about Sjogren's which are, and Raynaud's, which are conditions that can occur in patients with um, lupus. So Sjogren's is widely known as a dry eyes, dry mouth condition because the immune system in this condition is primarily 
attacking kind of the lacrimal glands, which is the tear gland, as well as the salivary glands. And for Raynaud's, the problem is more the blood vessels to the fingertips and the toes, but we'll find out in a minute that it may be a little bit more than that. Okay, so we'll, we'll tackle Raynaud's first, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about Shogun. So um, I'm going to talk about, well, what is Raynaud's? Do you have Raynaud's? Is it primary or secondary? How bad can it get? What are the myths and facts? And then how do you cope? So what is Raynaud's phenomena, right? So Raynaud's phenomena is an exaggeration to the body's normal reaction to certain conditions. So the certain conditions are flight or fright, right? So um, very dramatic. There's a lion chasing you, okay? So when the lion is chasing you, that is not the time to try to grow pretty fingernails. That is the time for the blood to shut down um, blood flow to the fingers and focus on blood flow to the heart so you can run faster and to the brain so you know what direction to run. It's a similar reaction that the body has. Remember you've heard those stories where somebody fell into this icy lake. The woman in my picture, I think she went in there voluntarily. But um, people fall into the icy lakes and you hear stories about how even an hour, a couple of hours after they still were able to revive them. And it's because the body does the same thing, which is shut down blood flow to non-essential organs. What do we really need to survive? The heart, the brain, those two things, and the lungs, right? So that's where the body just sh shuts down to the periphery and just doesn't in, um, indulge in kind of growing hair follicles or eyelashes, really focuses on the essential organs. So that's where Reynolds is coming from, is that exaggerated response to either flight or fright or when one is exposed to extreme temperatures. Okay, so I kind of hinted a little bit that it's about the blood vessels, what it is. And so what happens in Raynaud's, like I said, is there's a constriction of the blood vessels going to the extremities. So um, the, when the blood vessel constricts, then there's no blood flow. So it looks kind of whitish. Um, and then, because, I mean, it's not like, it, there's decreased blood flow, but there's a little bit of blood left there. And the little bit of blood left there, because the oxygen is being taken out by the cells around it, um, it turns blue. The lack of oxygen or the presence of carbon dioxide is really what makes it blue. And then after a while, the blood vessels open up. So the pipe open up and then blood flow heads in, blood heads back in there. And so we have red. So we have this red, white, and blue patriotic colors that happen in people with rain nodes. But when that blood flow comes back in, it can be painful. And so it's not just all oh, this discoloration and the person has no symptoms, but it's really more the pain that the patient experiences as that blood kind of heads back in. So this is kind of just another picture of what I was trying to describe. And um, so we asked patients, you know, are you usually, are you fingers unusually sensitive to cold? Do they change color when you're exposed to cold temperature? Do they go any of the white, blue, or red, or all of the three? Um, and then, you know, if a person has a positive response to all these questions, then we're really thinking that Raynaud's is probably right up there in the differential diagnosis or possibility. So Reynolds can be more than just hands and feet though. So Reynolds can affect a lot of other parts of the body. So, I mean, we can, it includes, I think I went back too fast, but I'll leave it. It includes like, you know, even the ears, um, the tip of the nose, nose. Um, it can be really debilitating. There are women who are breastfeeding and Reynolds can affect the breast. It can even affect the um, sexual organs. So it goes from where it's just a tiny little nuisance to where it can really be life altering. And so for some people, it can be really severe. Like I have this picture here and this uh, person's third finger, um, it started with Reynolds. There's really, the blood flow got so bad that the tissue at the tip of that finger died. And now we have this crossed and necrotic um, tissue in people who have severe Reynolds. But usually this kind of Reynolds that causes damage to the tissue is usually associated with another condition. And that's why we're having this conversation of Reynolds in people with lupus because Reynolds is a very common phenomenon 
in people that have lupus. Okay. So, um, so one of the questions that we ask, we want to find out really quickly is, is this Ray Nodes, is it just a lone ranger um, Ray Nodes, or is it, is it likely that it's associated with another condition? So we ask patients, we say, well, you know, um, do you get a rash when you get exposed to the sun, which is a common condition in people with lupus? Um, are your, is your skin getting really thick? Um, are you having blood in your urine? Just trying to figure out if the Raynaud is more of a lone ranger or if it's associated with other conditions that we have to watch for. Um, your doctor may run certain tests, again, really trying to do a deep dive to figure out if it's a primary Raynaud or associated with another condition. So a lot of those blood tests are to look for autoimmune diseases that can happen with Raynaud. And so when the workup is done, if the history is negative, and there's nothing on blood tests and there's nothing on physical examination, then the diagnosing comes, comes back to primary Raynaud's. So for some people though, Raynaud's can really be the first sign that there's something more serious going on. Um, and so um, for some people, it's also Raynaud's happening years before the onset of the condition. So you go, you see your doctor, and you know there's no evidence as an autoimmune disease going on. It's a good thing to kind of keep in touch, you know, maybe it's an annual physical, just to make sure things don't change. Most of the time, it's just the way note is primary, especially in younger women. Uh, but as we get older and it's happening in men and there's no clear underlying condition, it's a good idea to kind of keep in touch with your healthcare provider just to make sure that we don't miss anything because the opportunity to catch something early can really make a big difference in the quality of life. Okay, so what are the triggers for rain nodes? You know, like I said, you know, it's an, ex it's an exaggerated response to certain things. So it's an exaggerated response to cold. So cold is one of the most common things. So, and it's not necessarily the cold of the snow winter. It's even just moving from an air condition, from, a, from outside into an air conditioned room can trigger it. For some patients, even just walking down the aisle of the grocery store, um, picking up something from the refrigerator can cause an attack. I remember I said being chased by a lion. So that suggests that there's also the emotional adrenaline response. So even being startled, can trigger Raynaud's um, in patients. And a chill in the body can trigger Raynaud's. So, you know, whether it's cold temperatures and some variation of that, or some kind of adrenaline, excitement, emotional stress, those are things that can typically um, trigger Raynaud's phenomena. Okay. So other than the environment and emotions, there are certain medications. That's kind of one of the questions that your doctor would ask. Um, you, they'll go through your medical history and say, hey, um, are you taking any decongestants? So the way decongestants work is that they clamp down the blood vessels to the nasal sinuses, so it's not so droopy. Well, it clamps down the blood vessels to other places. So if a person is prone to Raynaud and then is put on some of these medications, it may clamp down those blood vessels. So a medication such as phenylephedrine, Pseudoephedrine, those are the typical decongestants. Some migraine headache medications can do that. Some herbs that have ephedra, medications used to treat ADHD. Now, I did list some medications, uh, but as always, you don't necessarily want to just stop the medication because you had this talk by the Dr. Dada. You want to talk to your doctor and make sure that your doctor can say, you know, we understand that there is this risk, but these are the benefits and maybe do some dose adjustments. So always best to kind of check for your own personal health um, so that things can be personalized. But these are kind of general things that your doctor would be looking at when you present with Raynaud's. So then there, you know, what are the natural, what are the things that you can do yourself, right? Um, so we talked about um, extreme, um, of extreme temperatures, right? So um, even in the spring, I'm, I'm really, I really care in the Northwest, right? It's, it's still kind of cold. So we still encourage people to dress warmly. So it's really the core temperature that matters. So wearing a pair of shorts and you know, a little 
um, half tank top and then gloves is not really going to cut it. And wearing a you know, little necktie like um, Kermit's hair is not going to cut it. We really need to make sure that the core temperature is warm. Um, we talked about medications. Um, so we kind of be careful with taking over the counter decongestants if you have rain nodes. During an attack, it can actually be aborted by putting the hands under cold, running warm water, rather. So running warm water can help to abort kind of an attack from rain nodes. De-stressing. Um, there's been so much stress in the last few years with all the isolation and you know, a lot of the stress that people have had. So really paying attention to self-care and de-stressing however you feel, and even making that connection to people. We found out that isolation is actually a big trigger for stress. Who knew we, we need people? And then smoking. The interesting thing about smoking, I think everybody already knows it's bad for you. It's also bad for Reynolds. But the thing about Reynolds is that even secondhand smoke is associated with worsening Reynolds. So that's probably important, you know, as things open up, we start going to bars and things, knowing that, you know, well, I don't think anybody smokes indoors anymore. Okay, so um, on that note, the next question is, well, you know, how can your doctor help, right? Um, so one, we talked about, you know, doing a history of physical obtaining blood tests, really trying to figure out if there's something else underlying that's contributing to the um, condition to Reynolds. And then finding out, you know, what have you done to, um, to kind of help to minimize the triggers. You've probably identified some triggers and some of those triggers may be things that you and your doctor can work on. There are conservative measures like we talked about earlier, keeping your core temperature warm. There are actually even hot packs that you can put in your pockets. Um, I encourage my patients to kind of even get like this um, ski socks. Um, those are nice thick socks. And, and I encourage them not to walk in the garage barefooted. Right. Um, but there are some medications that help. And those medications, if we kind of think back to what's happening, is that the blood vessels are clamping down. So these medications are typically high blood pressure medications. Very interesting the way they work. But what they do is they open up the pipes so that when your heart pumps out blood, it doesn't pump it out against resistance. That's how the, those medications work. But for our for rain nodes, it's perfect because we're trying to open up the pipes. So calcium channel blockers are medications uh, that we use um, to treat rain nodes. Interestingly, even some SSRIs, which are antidepressants, also help to open up the blood vessels. But those are like second or third tier. Really mostly it's pills that are calcium channel blockers or even topical nitroglycerin ointments that are calcium channel blockers. So your doctor may start with just the ointment and then move to pills, but really has to make sure your blood pressure can tolerate it. Okay, so I kind of had some fun. It's fun in the rheumatology world to talk about facts and myths. So, um, so Raynaud's B is, is a rare disease. That's actually not true. One in 10 people will have Raynaud's. That means that every person you meet has probably know somebody who has Reynolds. It may not necessarily be the most severe form, um, uh, but Reynolds is pretty common. So that would be a myth. Um, Reynolds sufferers have poor circulation. Well, you know, they do have intermittent episodes of poor circulation, but it's not a problem where they have more of a chronic poor circulation issue, unless it's associated with some underlying condition. Right? Um, Reynolds is an allergy to the cold. So when we really think about allergies, we think about, you know, when you get stung by a bee and your face gets swollen and you have skin rashes and your tongue is swollen, that's not what's happening to Reynolds in Reynolds. So it's not necessarily an allergy to the cold. And like we said, cold is not the only trigger, right? So it's not a cold allergy. Reynolds always involves the patriotic colors, red, white, and blue. Um, sometimes, but sometimes, you know, it's just, you know, the hands just turn white or the hands just turn red. Um, so really getting that triggering um, that the patient tells you is really what kind of opens up your thought process. So, you know, this may be kind of a not as aggressive form as we know it, um, as some others that have that three-phase color discoloration. And then we all know that Reynolds does not only occur in the winter, because we have that discussion. Um, so that's, I think, a little bit about Reynolds. And, um, 
And then we'll talk about Sjogren's a little bit. So like we said, those are two very common conditions that happen in people with lupus. So let's go for Sjogren's. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, what Sjogren's is, you know, uh, I'll describe a patient of mine who had a, a symptom and we talked through, you know, why it could be Sjogren's. Again, is it primary or secondary? Uh, because both Sjogren's and Raynaud's can be on their own as lone ranges, or they can be associated with other conditions. And we can talk about how to prevent dry mouth, which is a big deal um, because it's associated with dental caries. And then we'll talk about, you know, what the role of your healthcare professional and your doctor is. So my patient, Lauren, is a 35-year-old who comes in because um, her grandmom had um, Sjogren's and she wonders if her dry eyes and dry mouth could be Sjogren's. And so we talked a little bit about well, what is Sjogren's. So Sjogren's is an autoimmune disease where the immune system is causing inflammation in the salivary glands and also in the lacrimal glands. So some people, it can be so severe that you can actually see the lacrimal glands swollen and you can see the swelling of the parotid area. That is the most common um, manifestation, the dry eyes, dry mouth, but Sjogren's can also kind of be a little more severe where basically every area of your body that produces moisture can go dry. So whether it's um, even your throat going dry, problems with the intestine, skin getting dry, the vaginal area getting dry, um, so basically, um, other than dryness, we can also have where the organs are at risk. Now, this is not the most common form of Sjogren's, um, but it's still important to know. I get consults with that, you know, with other doctors asking, hey, um, you know, this organ is involved. So when the there's a lung, the patient is short of breath, there's inflammation in there, joints are swollen, there are issues with the liver, issues with the intestine, muscle inflammation, and um, like we already talked about vaginal dryness. So Sjogren can just be the dry eyes, dry mouth, which is bad enough. So I mean, I'd hate to, for people to kind of live with the impression that it's not a big deal. It actually can be for patients who are really dealing with it as it can get quite severe. So um, talking about severity, so the dry eyes can actually feel like you have like sandpaper in your eyes. And the dry mouth can be so bad that when you wake up in the morning, your tongue is stuck to the roof of your mouth, right? And so people have like accelerated dental decay because the saliva is full of antimicrobial substances, right? So it has antibacterial properties. And so when you're not producing it and there's food particles in the mouth, then the bacteria is just going unopposed. So there is, you know, one of the most important part of Sjogren's is also making sure that there's good oral hygiene. And like I said, so your doctor would do blood tests and there's specific antibodies known as SSA and SSB. Those two antibodies are typically associated with Sjogren's and they come under that umbrella of the anti-nuclear antibody. An anti-nuclear antibody is just an antibody that your body produces against itself, which kind of goes back to that initial slide that we had about how the body is attacking its own cells and that's what the autoimmune disease is so we still have that you know is this primary is it just dry eyes dry mouth alone or is it dry eyes dry mouth associated with other autoimmune conditions very commonly children's can occur with patients with lupus children's can occur with patients with rheumatoid arthritis um, so we ask patients, you know, do you have swollen joints? Um, are your wrists swollen? Do you have the rashes from lupus? Any trouble breathing? And we try to identify if the Sjogren is on its own as a lone ranger or in addition to something else. This is where blood tests also come in handy. And if the patient has no evidence of another medical condition, then we come back just like we did to Reynolds, that this is primary Sjogren and we just treat it that, that way. So the dry mouth is probably one of the most, um, I think one of the most distressing for people because, and it may, unless you really had it where you're waking up in the middle of the night uh, multiple times because dry mouth can wake you up. And when you, you now you wake up in the morning and you really haven't had a good night's sleep. You wake up fatigued and brain fogged, all that because you didn't have a good night's sleep because you have dry mouth. So then we go to, well, how can we prevent it, right? Obviously 
we've had this conversation to that person no no right um there is actually artificial saliva we encourage people to drink water frequently um there actually there's a medication that can stimulate what's left of the saliva glands to produce that saliva so hopefully through the night you're not waking up multiple times when we talk about hydration though we have to be careful that we're not drinking things that have a low ph so very acidic um, substances so that includes things like all this artificial you know the cola coca-cola drinks um i love tea i was just looking at that tea also has a low ph but not as low as um uh, coffee so coffee you know for those coffee lovers you know um it does lower the ph and just makes everything much more acidic in the mouth which promotes the decay right so we want to try to make sure that we're drinking things that have more of a neutral ph um, sleeping with the mouth open is pretty obvious, right? And not that we have that much control over it, but maybe there are some mouth guards and things that we can use to try to reduce the oral aperture while we're sleeping. And then we talked about fluid hydration um, and just ways to kind of make sure that we maintain some moisture in the mouth. So we're back to what can your doctor do? So, well, you know, so confirm the diagnosis, obviously. Um, treat dry eyes. So there are things from even for the eyes as artificial tears all the way to eye drops that actually help to combat the inflammation. And so, I mean, you, and dry eyes may not seem like a big deal, but every time you open and close your eyelid, it's like sandpaper. And so that tends to start to irritate the cornea and starts in irritating the outer lining of the eyes. So making sure that the eye is moisturized is important, right? Um, and then treatment of dry mouth, we talked about that a little bit. Um, and I, as I said, there are also medications that can improve the flow of saliva, but there are other things that we can do conservatively to improve oral hygiene, which is the number one problem that people with dry mouth have. And then of course, we talked about contributing or associated conditions that can make the symptoms of sugarings worse. We really haven't talked about when sugarings goes past the glands and becomes more of a systemic condition. That is a little more complicated and definitely, um, definitely need to be on board with your doctor and collaborating uh, like Paula had recommended. So, you know, I, I'd like to take a step back and just talk about things that we can do to reduce the risk for developing autoimmune diseases. So, you know, there are even things like environmental toxins, which is not on this slide, uh, but, you know, um, insecticides have been found to trigger autoimmune diseases, right? So being very careful as to um, environmental exposure, even the foods that we eat, the processed foods that we're eating, a lot of that, I mean, sometimes we just don't have a choice because you've got to grab something and go, you've got to feed those four kids. But, you know, a lot of times if we can kind of cook healthy, wholesome foods without a lot of preservatives, it tends to minimize the risk that will trigger our immune system. So one, going back to kind of the basics, um, getting adequate sleep, right? So um, when, when, when we don't get adequate sleep, um, the nerve, the brain is a nerve, and that's how it rests. And so it starts to go into overdrive, um, whether it is because we're looking at our phones during the night, which is a very bad habit, um, or whether you know we have something else that is minimizing the sleep hygiene. You wake up tired and your brain is telling you that you need more sleep, right? And your brain can actually trigger your immune system if it is not well taken care of. Healthy diet, I mean, there's healthy diet, I think it's all the rave right now, but I think the most, the best studied diet is more the Mediterranean diet, and also looking more like at a plant-based diet. I think those probably have more of the data than a lot of the other things being touted. Um, exercising regularly, I, I really encourage my patients to try to get at least 30 minutes a day of some kind of exercise. And you know, I believe, you know, and it makes sense that you go slow, right? If exercise is not something that you've done in the past, start with five minutes, but just start, right? Uh, that you have nothing to prove, you just start and because you want to make it um, a way of life, right? So it's going to be a long term habit that you're developing. So getting up from the couch, running a mile, and then being exhausted with strained ankles does no one any good. So you want to kind of start slow and just pace yourself 
and so that you can incorporate it into your lifestyle. I think stress reduction and healthy relationships kind of go together. As, as I said earlier, a lot of the isolation that we've all had to endure because of the pandemic has really brought out how we're so dependent on each other. And so making those efforts to really continue the communication skills and make sure you have shared, life is stressful, right? But finding a way to make sure that we're able to manage that and managing that even through support, through friends, relationships, is, goes a, a, a long way to helping us manage and prevent autoimmune diseases. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you so much for listening and I'd love to hear questions um, or thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Dada, for your uh, terrific presentation. We do have a few questions for you. Um, I'll just comment first that you answered some of them expertly through your presentation, some questions about how to ease symptoms and also about diet, including the Mediterranean diet. So thank you very much for uh, building that into your presentation. I'm going to go to some of the other questions that uh, came up uh, during your presentation. Uh, here's one question from Linda. Is the frequency or severity of Raynaud's evidence of worsening lupus? Is the frequency of, I'm sorry, Sim I missed that part. Yeah, so uh, sorry, my screen is bouncing around a little bit here. Uh, basically it was, um, sorry, there's so many questions coming in. Oh, okay. my, Screen is bouncing around a little bit. One moment. I think I heard something about um, if the if if Sjogren's is getting worse, does that mean that lupus is getting worse? Is that what? That was? Yeah, I think it it was if if the frequency is increasing, is it getting worse? Is your yeah. lupus getting yeah, worse? Yeah. I, I, I think that it, it probably means that your lupus is not under good control, right? Um, but yes, it could be that if you're having, if despite good control, at some point symptoms are now deteriorating, then you're right. Then that suggests that things are getting worse and we probably need to address it in some way. Great, thank you. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a question from Gloria, does Renault cause fatigue? I think we know it will cause fatigue primarily um, one if it's associated with another condition, right? But if it's on its own, it's unlikely to. Now, some for some people, Reynolds is aggravated by stress. So is the stress causing the Reynolds and causing the fatigue? Um, you know, and, and then of course, if the Reynolds is so painful that you're waking up multiple times at night, you know, because it's just not under control then again, you know, then you're fatigued because there's green fog and there's insomnia and you're not getting a good quality of sleep, so. Great, thank you. We have a question from Elaine. Can you get severe foot and leg spasms from Raynaud's? So I think you can get foot spasms, right? Just from the poor blood supply. But by the time you get into the kind of the calf muscles, there's so many collateral blood vessels that it's very difficult to shut those down. So the further you are from the mid foot, the less likely that those symptoms are pure ring nodes, right? So, um, so I hope that answers the question. But yes, I think you can definitely get pain, spasms, um, pins and needles in the foot, at least, you know, I would say in extreme cases, maybe the whole foot because there can be some radicular pain. But by the time you start getting above the ankles, the blood vessels are massive. And so it's less likely that we notice causing symptoms all the way up. So we have to look at other things like maybe peripheral vascular disease or something else. Thank you. Uh, we have a question, another question from Linda. Is geographic tongue a symptom of Sjogren's? No, geographic tongue is not a symptom of Sjogren's. There's really no clear understanding as to the, it's the you know, reason why people have geographic tongue. It's been associated in some cases with vitamin deficiencies, but not necessarily a symptom of Sjogren's. 
Although Thank people you. with showgreens can have like a secondary fungal infection on their tongue. So I'm not sure if that may be what the person may be experiencing too. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Shantia. What else can be done with dry eyes if I feel the things I'm trying don't work? So for example, sometimes the eyes feel more dry when I use eye drops. Okay, so it just depends on, so you know, there's just the over-the-counter artificial eye drops. And one has to be careful that you're using artificial tears and nothing that has, nothing like clear eyes. Because clear eyes actually is supposed to make your sclera look nice and white and bright. Um, but by doing that, actually causes vessel, it causes your blood vessels to cramp down. So it gives you that nice clear vision. But assuming you're using the right artificial tears, there are actually something called restasis, which is a prescription, which is actually just a topical anti-inflammatory medication. But there are other things like, you know, um, plugs can be put in. Um, into the um, into the um, uh, eye eye um, eye duct um, lacrimal duct um, if necessary. So for some people, it it has to be something as invasive as surgical options. But there is a slew of options. So definitely worth talking to your ophthalmologist if the over the counter eye drops are not effective. Thank you. Oh, also omega threes are also helpful for dry eyes. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Betsy. Are there specialists that focus on Sjogren's that is systemic? So when Sjogren's is systemic, are there specialists that focus specifically on that uh, course of the disease? So I think it's probably a combination of your rheumatologist and or depending on what part of the body is affected, right? So if it's the lungs, then your rheumatologist needs to confer with the pulmonologist to kind of, because sometimes they want to put a scope down your lungs and see what's going on. So the kind of rheumatologist kind of needs the expertise. So at that point, you're probably looking at a multidisciplinary, which just means multiple specialists that kind of have to work together to make sure that, you know, you're getting the care that you need. But yeah, if it starts to have involved different organs, then your specialists probably have to work together at that point. So there probably is not a one Sjogren's specialist for when the Sjogren starts to affect other parts of the body. Thank you. We have one more question and then we'll continue on with my uh, final resources. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, what treatments can you try for inflamed sal salivary glands or painful jaw lines with Sjogren's? So, um, so it depends on what's causing it, right? So the best thing is to figure out what's causing it. So it could be, you know, because there's not a lot of inflam, it's not a lot of flow of saliva in there, could the ducts actually be, have stones in them, right? And is that something that, that would be the most painful, right? If you have some stones in there um, from the salivary glands not producing or expelling the saliva, and things get very concentrated and you have like salivary gland stones, that would be the most painful. Um, but other than that, then it could be maybe an infection in there, or maybe it's just inflamed. Some cases you use steroids just to treat the inflammation. But again, it's, you, know, can, you can see how the treatment differs. If there's a stone, if it's infected, if there's inflammation. So different treatments for the different causes of the, of the painful salivary glands. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dada. We can't thank you enough for being with us this evening. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Terrific. So with that, uh, some of you are new to the Lupus Foundation of America, and some of you have uh, been joining with us uh, over these last number of years. But I did want to share a, a few resources uh, for all of you, including some new resources that uh, debuted just a few weeks ago. At the Lupus Foundation, uh, our vision is truly a life free of lupus. And our mission is uh, dedicated to improving the quality of life uh, for all people affected by this disease through our programs of research, education, support, and advocacy. One of the best repositories of information is our online library or our National Resource Center on Lupus. 
I use this all the time. I, if I have a question, I'm always learning. Uh, and so one of the things that I do is go to the National Resource Center on Lupus online at lupus.org slash resources, and I search. It can be a great first line of defense to get the information that you need. But sometimes you need that personal touch. We also have health education specialists at our national office with the Lupus Foundation. You can find additional information about how to reach out to a health educational specialist at lupus.org. Also, uh, we have opportunities for you to connect with peers through our support groups. In this part of the US, we have two support groups that you can meet with. Uh, they meet monthly. You can find additional information about how to connect with your peers in the lupus community through lupus.org slash Pacific Northwest. And finally, if you want to spread your network even farther, uh, you could join Lupus Connect, which is our online community, online global community, where people uh, can engage and share information about their experiences with lupus. You can learn more about Lupus Connect on lupus.org. Recently, we deb debuted some new tools for helping you uh, manage your life with lupus. This tool is called Self. So what is Self? Self is a free online self-management program designed to help people with lupus live their very best life. We asked many people who live with lupus as well as rheumatologists uh, for their opinion about this program along the way in its development. It also helps people with lupus to build and enhance their skills in four key areas or pillars, managing their symptoms, managing stress, managing their medications, and working with your healthcare team. So how does it work? Once you register, there's an initial 20 minute <laughs> onboarding assessment. And once you've done that, you can choose your initial focus area um, to uh, basically learn more during the first two weeks. At the end of that two week uh, session, you'll have a little mini review to help reinforce what you've learned. And then you can continue with two week educational sessions at your own pace. After 90 days, uh, there is an assessment so we can see how um, helpful uh, or ways to improve uh, our work through the self system. And that takes about 20 minutes. So to get started, you go to the self landing page, which you can find at lupus.org slash self. Uh, this landing page includes really helpful background information, a promotional video, uh, some various uh, questions in a short training video, as well as the link to join self. So once you get started, uh, you can register uh, using the link on the landing page. <clears throat> it's quite simple and you can use your email address or your Facebook or Google login account. And you can pause anytime and return later to continue uh, working in the self system. Some of the features that are included in the self online utility are a customized activity center, a symptom tracker, medication tracker, a journal, uh, something that Paula spoke about, as well as you can connect directly to some of the resources I just mentioned, uh, connecting with our education specialists, the National Resource Center on Lupus and support groups and Lupus Connect. Uh, you will also receive text message tips and encouragement along the way. So with that, <clears throat> I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. It's terrific to gather as a community. I'd also like to again thank Paula White and Dr. Dada for sharing your expertise this evening. So thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Good night, everyone.